All right, we just arrived at New Monkey Studios. I know some of you had inquired after our uh, Manny's Mic Locker with Killer Cortez on the whole rundown microphones that were owned and sang and used by Elliot Smith to their own collection. But now I'm with their partner, Joel Graves. Good to see you. Good to see you, my old friend. <laughs> we we go way back. We've been mutual, like, his band was Everest and Aaron from Early Mart and the Ship Studio. So, like, the family ties of us go back into the late 90s to the early 2000s of how we've yeah. crossed roads. But I'm honored here to find out that he is one of the owners of this studio with... Cortez, Killer Cortez. Yeah, um, Cortez, and Robert Capadona is also Yeah, Robert. We can't forget Robert, right? Where's Robert? Robert is like the Wizard of Oz. You yeah. Know? He's the man behind the scenes, like, keeping us afloat and making sure it's all going. So, nice. Yeah. Well, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with this, we're in Van Nuys, California. This studio is located definitely in kind of a working blue-collar neighborhood. The studio is a reflection of that. It's located in a... Uh, commercial zone, but it's a wonderful long, uh, almost like a hallway of the mic locker, then it goes into the control room, and then it goes into the tracking room, and then they have some small rooms for guitars, and we'll go through those tours really quick. So give us your insight on when you became owners of this, how did that happen, and then some of the things you guys have been up to lately before we start a tour. Sure. About nine and a half years ago, or we're coming up on our 20th year here, um, I got together with some friends and uh, we, my friend Karen Rose, a uh, music writer, had let me know that Elliot's studio was for sale after wow. he passed away. I was in the band Early Mart mm -hmm. uh, and Aaron Espinosa, the lead person, was friends uh, with Elliot and had been recording him and helping him with a bunch of projects towards the end of Elliot's life. And two of my Early Mart band members, uh, Scott McPherson and Ariana Murray, were also playing with Elliot at the time yeah. of his passing. So we were pretty close involved with the, in the scene with each other at that time. When he passed away, we heard that the studio was available through my friend Karen. I called Robert, uh, who was I was working with at a place called Vapor Records. and uh, I did a record. I did some records with Vapor. I did uh, Elliot Robert's son. Oh, oh yeah, Jason. Jason. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So I did Jason's solo record at my old studio. Yeah, and that was and that I came through when you guys were doing that. Yeah, that's what that was uh that I was one that was one of our passings, you know. Yeah. I that came, record's amazing. And I remember coming to hang during yeah. those sessions and you were showing me the control room and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> What's up Jason? <laughs> Jason Yates, man, what a legend. Yeah. Um we kind of looked at it and it, it didn't make sense financially and we talked to Jason Lytle and Aaron Espinosa, mm -hmm. who are studio friends, studio yeah. interested friends. And we kind of were all talking about maybe going in on it and trying to do it. And it eventually it didn't work out and we kind of, we, we couldn't afford to do it. It didn't make sense financially and we passed. And a few months later, Elliot's sister Ashley called me up and said, hey, the family's thinking about selling it to a studio broker and they're going to piece out all the gear, oh, the Fairchild, the A-Range, the U-48. They were all going to just be sold to whoever would buy them. So it all would have been split up. So uh, they were, they had lowered the price somewhat at that point. So we came in, Robert and I came in and decided we wanted to make another offer and we mm -hmm. went for it. And here we are coming up on 20 years later. We still got it. You did it. You and did we're it. still making music here. So yeah, yeah. it's it's constantly, uh, Greg, Greg Cortez became our partner uh, almost 10 Get years here, ago Greg. now. Come on. <laughs> And uh, this this man here, uh, who's you guys saw on Manny's mic locker, um, has been helping us keeping this place running. Uh, so we're active every day because of uh, this man, and uh, that's the goal is to just keep making music here. Well, awesome. Well, we're gonna get to our tour now, and um, let's do it. Here we are going into what I would say is possibly the guitar room. And what is the actual official name? The Red Room? We call it the Red Room, yeah. Um, it's got kind of red lights and a red vibe in here for the most part. And uh, this is a ISO room slash can be a vocal booth or a drum booth here at New Monkey. And uh, it also is where, fortunately, I get to kind of keep all my guitars and put things uh, when I'm not on tour so other people can uh, use them as well. And, and just really quick, so obviously you're looking at a bunch of Gibsons. We're going to be going to the, is it considered the fender wall on the other side? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so they're kind of, uh, they are kind of uh, set up more of a Gibson Epiphone vibe on mm -hmm. the side. A lot, you see more humbuckers, but also some P90s. Oh, cool, well, let's run down, let's run the garden here of what we sure. got. So we got obviously a, 
a, a Hofner base, the first one up, correct? Yeah, this is a Hofner very thin base. Uh, it's a newer model, um, which I just dug because it's got a great feel. Um, it's got a kind of a long scale, skinny neck. It's mm -hmm. a very different vibe. Flat wound strings, so it has that thumpiness of, of flat wound. Not a lot of high end, but it's a cool tool to have here in the studio for that sound. Nice. And then next lap, this is a, a 64 uh, Epiphone Granada. It's one of my favorite songwriting guitars. Um, acoustically sounds really good. It's um, beautiful. That pickguard looks pretty Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting and it's literally heavy duty because all the electronics are built into the pickguard. So mm -hmm. if you take the pickguard off and, and uh, release the ground, it's, it's pretty much I love just this. an acoustic guitar. I love those headstocks, man. Those are beautiful headstocks. Yeah, yeah. When I was younger, right. um, because I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, Epiphones weren't really looked upon. I mean, I know now everybody's right. like, oh yeah, the Beatles and da da da, but when we were younger, no one, everybody wanted a Gibson headstock. So it's yeah. really interesting how things have changed. And now between their SGs, their Flying Bs, and, and the Epiphone brand. Um, when I was in school, I used to have an Epiphone acoustic that had that same type of headstock. And to this day, I've, I'm always kind of looking to see. I don't exactly remember what model it was, but that was probably my first time of going, these are quality, cool guitars. Well, I mean, that's kind of, this, this guitar was my first Epiphone that I got, and it kind of led me into the Epiphone hallway because I then found this one, mm -hmm. which is a 67 Casino, um, which is similar to the Gibson 330, if not nearly and identical. And everybody says the John Lennon one, right? Or, or yeah, so, and this one is in that era where uh, both Lennon and George Harrison had uh, this sort of era of uh, of casino. Uh, McCartney also had one. I think his was the year earlier, so he had a slightly different uh, casino, um, different a slightly different configuration and stuff, but this is kind of the classic Beatles configuration and uh, of course like I, I actually I hate to say this but I found this at a very special place for me for finding vintage instruments Guitar Center. Oh shoot. <laughs> uh, I got this at a Guitar Center and uh, it was a deal I couldn't believe for, for what it is and it plays and sounds great and uh, this became one of my main touring guitars for uh, both Early Martin, Everest, two bands that I played in. And uh, yeah, it's it's got the, the F holes are covered for live use uh, just so what did you cover with, with tape? No, it's actually a thin layer of foam, uh, like a very thin layer of foam just covering the holes. Oh, so wow. It's actually easy to remove as well. Is that something you'd buy or did you make it? No, it's just a thin, dense, uh, thin but higher density foam. Um, yeah, you can. Oh yeah, I can feel it. Yeah. But it's not the kind that is uh, that's going to fall apart or crumble. It's it's almost or like for a while at least. It's almost like what you would see when they pack a microphone or something that rubber kind of uh, yeah, inside, yeah. right? Yeah, it is kind of that. I guess it's sort of a rubberized foam. Yeah. It's almost like neoprene. Well, cool. And I'm then assuming. this is a Les Paul. This is a '90s Les Paul. It's been refinished and it's just it sounds good, feels good, gets used quite a bit. I feel like all of, there's actually one in the control room okay. uh, that I'll point out when we get into there. Uh, we have a, uh, a Texan, uh, Epiphone Texan, speaking of Epiphones, uh, acoustic. It's one of the great acoustics I've mm -hmm. ever played and it's one of those guitars also bought at the vintage secret spot of Guitar Center where I found it at a ridiculously <laughs> good price. That's a good tip uh, that I'm giving away there. Hey, I'm always <laughs> online to Guitar Center and this is a tip to everyone. I mean, just like if you want a let's say you want a spring reverb for or yeah spring reverb like a fender tube reverb from the 50s or 60s make a search at the guitar center and sometimes we'll show up in like indiana or something and it's like you know 700 bucks or 600 but you can't find those in boutique stores anymore so guitar exactly, center yeah, yeah space kind of echo is the same thing you know yeah yeah that's true um this this one in particular probably has been used the most throughout my my career on mm -hmm. recordings and stuff uh this casino um was used in both everest and early mart 
Um, and but also this is a, a '67 Gibson Trini Lopez. Oh, that's so beautiful. Uh, oh, that's right. I didn't notice the headstock. And so, oh my God, these are uh, these guitars are gems if you can ever get an, an original like this one. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is, and, and it's funny you mentioned the headstock. The the headstock is not original. Um, I actually had a luthier here in town replace it because right at short, I bought the guitar off of Craigslist while, mm -hmm. I, while I was on tour with Everest and uh, I think the headstock snapped in its case after show number three or something like that, oh, like man. just after I bought it. So I ended up bringing it back to LA where it was eventually repaired, uh, brought back to better than ever and uh, it's really strong now and I ended up continuing to use it live. Uh, including I played it on uh, Letterman when we played on Letterman in uh, I think 2012 and so the original headstock that snapped became uh, a part of uh, a little piece of crafty art here at New Monkey it's a mm -hmm. it's a part of our front door logo oh. now. so when you walk in here you'll notice that there's a firebird headstock very weathered from being out in the heat and the rain now but yeah. that was off of this Trini Lopez originally that was the original headstock is now part of our door all right now we're at the fender wall of the red room <laughs> yeah the fender side of the room is uh, it's a little more bass heavy mm -hmm. um, got the sort of 52p variety and then uh, this jag that we have it's a baritone that's kind of set up more like a Fender 6 kind of vibe. Um, what would be the difference between the baritone and a Fender 6? Gauge it's of the strings? the tuning, yeah, gauge of strings and tuning. Um, mm -hmm. I believe the Fender 6 had a slightly longer neck length as well. Um, so when you get a baritone set up that way, you're kind of finagling it a little bit. But mm -hmm. it works, it does the thing, and it can kind of do that that thumpy, bassish sort of vibe. But it's also just good as a baritone um, when you tune it that way too. And uh, next to that's a little Mustang that I put together and kind of modded up. And what was it? Oh, you put the p bass pickups in it, correct? Well, that's a model that Fender was, uh, Fender released. Uh, it's one of their mashup sort of models. Mm -hmm. With the, it's the, jazz and p-bass mashup kind of thing saw richard swift playing one of these and kind of realized how cool the short scale mustang bass is uh in general really fun to play um and i play bass in a couple projects that i work on so i kind of got this uh, for myself as as something i can use but uh it feels so good and it's really fun to play so people have been using it a lot at the studio which is cool i recorded this band called dark of my love which is a los yeah. angeles pretty iconic yeah I awesome band Rob, the bass player, used to play those. It was my first experience because his sound was so massive. And Rob's a huge dude, probably, I'm sure, six foot plus. Mm -hmm. But he had this little baby bass. But man, did it, oh, it made Looks me like go like, play, yeah, it gave you the illusion of, okay, bigger basses don't necessarily need to matter. It's the sound. And Rob, I mean, yeah. Rob had it, you know. Well, some of these short scale things, I mean, also, uh, we've got a little acoustic here too. Some of the small things sound bigger. Uh -huh. um, the, the short scale bass has a certain kind of low end thump to it that I think is cool for if you're going for more of like a dub sound or something like that. It can do that too, yeah. which is pretty cool. And uh, I mean, same thing with this. This little bodied acoustic actually projects really well and has a unique sound. This is a little baby Taylor. Um, this thing was definitely used originally um, in early Mart for stuff and then uh, oftentimes I'd play through an amp and use the... That is so cool, you just taped it in there. Yeah, <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the old style of doing things, not being shy with the yeah. gaff tape. And so uh, that, and then I ended up using this in Everest um, on our song "Let Go" live. I would play this, so I ended up using this on uh, some of the late night TV shows and stuff. I love like the that designs. It's almost like Indian on the side. Yeah, well, this was a this was actually uh, on tour. Corey Murchie, the bass player from the band Minus the Bear, painted this on there for me. Did he so, tell you he was going to do that? He borrowed it overnight uh, and. Uh, I said, do whatever you want with it. Okay. This, this is what it came back with. He's a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for, and it says here, for every turn, a new tail. I love that. And he's from New Mexico, so it's it's got that, uh, the New Mexico yeah. snake vibe to it. Yeah, this is a baby Taylor. 
um, which the actual logo has been covered up from it being in a Corona commercial with our, oh. our band Everest was cool. playing the song on the Corona beach in uh, Tulum, Mexico. So that one's here. It's kind of a, just a cool, funky machine to make different sounds with, mm -hmm. um, along with some of the other acoustics. And then also on the Fender wall, we've got the two classics, mm -hmm. uh, Black Strat, that was uh, American-made Strat, a gift from my good friend Brad Barish. And that's been at the studio, I think, the, the entire time we've owned the place. Next to that is a 52 reissue Telecaster. That, it's beautiful. Uh, I've kind of used as a workhorse live for years. Uh, if I had like a European tour or something where I needed to just bring one guitar, sometimes mm -hmm. it would be just this because this has that Fender thing of feeling like uh, it's it's indestructible, and it's got a big a Fender branded Bigsby on it, which is kind of neat. Mm -hmm. I'm a total SG guy, and I see there's a little SG sneaking on the Fender wall. Can you tell us about uh, that one? <laughs> this is usually hanging up, so really? oftentimes it's up over there too. Yeah, this is. Uh, you may recognize this as I do as a mid '70s SG. Uh, this is a '76. Um, whenever I see these, I, I think of one person and one person only, and that's Ian Mackay. Um, that's I think I bought this because of my my love of Fugazi, a band I, a band I saw you open for. Oh, so. dude. Um, okay, but back to the bass. So yeah. we have our SG. I love Danos. Is there a story between that? Yeah, one? the Dano. Um, this I just uh, have a little bit of a relationship with Dan Electro nowadays, and uh, they they were nice enough to hook me up with this. Um, was doing some touring stuff with Father John Misty and wanted a 12-string electric for some of that. And uh, this is a newer Dan Electro that I kind of went off of the. Uh, the shape of the pick guard and wow. turned it into Casper the Ghost. 12 string. I love it. Um, so yeah, it's got a, it's got kind of a vibe, but it's cool because the, I mean, as you know, these Dan Electros. Has a spooky vibe. Yeah, a little spooky vibe too. And I mean, these pickups are a bit spooky. Yeah. so it's kind of perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, as you know, these Dan Electros are amazing instruments. They're still made really similar yep. to how they were. So um, it's it's got that you know that Jimmy Page vibe, but in the 12 string model, yep. which is. Just again, it's useful to always have a 12 string at the studio. Um, I tell bands all the time, like, can you just go out buy a Dano? They're five, six hundred bucks. David Hidalgo yeah. had guitars a. guitars that can sound really good. And yeah. I mean, it's not about the price of stuff, anyways. So. Los Dobos did a record called Tin Can Trust at my old studio. Mm -hmm. And David Hidalgo had had, I think it was called A Country Gentleman by Gretsch, which was yeah. a 12 string. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's beautiful. And then he was playing it, and then like a day later, he goes, ah, I'm going to get this other guitar. And he brought in that same model of a 12 string Dano, and he yeah. smoked it. And I was like, okay. And that's something I don't have for my studio, but I, that's what I'd be lacking would be a 12 string Dan Electro, which is just a must for any cool indie or textural studio because it just, gets the job done. This this was mandatory that we have one of these here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the Yamaha FG 180, uh, which is known as like the, the Elliott Smith model. All right. And uh, yeah, it's just a, this, we found a good playing, good sounding one. I think somebody had done some work uh, on it already to on the bridge to lower the action a bit and didn't need a neck reset or anything. So. Now we're at the back of the wall, which yes, there are synths in here. Yeah, we've got Danny Witten kind of overseeing our, our keyboard rig here, which is kind of fitting because the first one up top, this is a um, Univox Stringman. Uh, these are pretty rare. I kept my eye open for one of these for years because mm -hmm. this is the famous uh, weird chorusy phasey keyboard that you hear on Neil Young's Like a Hurricane. And uh, this is the one that he uses live. If you ever s have seen Neil Young live and and this bird drops out of the rafters uh -huh. and someone will walk up and play keyboards. This is what's inside the, the painted piece bird that drops out of the ceiling. Now you um, got to tour with Neil Young, so you were like, got a little... Yeah, I got a couple, uh, and I, I, uh, I, I got a couple insights into his rig over the years, and I actually guitar teched for him. Uh, for a show once, so I got a really in-depth look through his rig then. Yeah, he, he used one of those Baldwin uh, PAs for a while as, as part of his massive thing. 
Doesn't uh, Willie Nelson use a Baldwin amp? I thought yeah, someone Willie talked uses about one that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah those, uh, and they're just really loud, clean, um, oh, da um, solid-state Dave, amps. Dave Catching out in the desert. I did oh, the, yeah, yeah. I did awesome. a Joshua Tree, and he pointed out that that was Willie Nelson's favorite. He didn't know it at the time. He had bought it, thought it was cool, and then he come to find out it's Willie Nelson's kind of amp. I was like, oh my god, I got to find that, you know. Yeah, they're great. They're great little amps, and I think they can be used for a lot of different things. Uh, Neil, kind of, he's got a really interesting rig, and um, yeah, he's used all kinds of stuff. And I, I got really into tweed amps. So as you look around the studio, you'll see some of the influence yeah, of that. Right there. Some, some things like oh, that's a beauty. This wow. tucked away. Um, what is that? Like what era? This is year? a champ. I think this this is a '61 champ. Mm -hmm. Uh, which puts it uh, right at the end of the tweeds. I think that this is probably one of the last, you know. And for studio people, like of sometimes you wouldn't know it, but the biggest guitar sounds come from little amps. Yeah, I think of it almost that's kind of a specialty here, right. and, and of stuff that I love is there's a lot of 50s and 60s smaller tube amps that. Um, we just find them really useful here in the studio. So we moved from the red room and now we'd be in what he would consider, I, I guess I would say the tracking room. Yeah. Very cool, uh, very home, feels like home in here. And uh, what have we got here on this really beautiful piano? Yeah, this is a 1917 Strober built in Chicago. Um, so it's over a hundred years old and uh, this seems to make it on almost every record that's done here. Um, it's got a, a certain funky timbre and quality mm -hmm. to it that is appealing, of course. Yeah. It's got a kind of a funny story uh, behind it. Um, my mom called me and was like, the school district is selling all these pianos. You should come have a look. And sure enough, I go down to uh, Garden Grove to check out this sale that Garden Grove mm -hmm. School District is having. And I found this piano and I played it a little bit and I thought, wow, it sounds pretty cool but also it was terribly out of tune like it just it mm -hmm. just needed some love so i looked at it and sure enough they wanted a whopping 25 dollars for it <laughs> um so that money was put down immediately and uh, yeah. I, I called some friends who helped me move this up here and uh, it's been here ever since it's been played from everybody from father john misty to luke from the kooks and it's really useful having a piano, obviously, and uh, because we have sort of a small, intimate space here, it's nice to have it upright to to save on some space. One thing space I will say, well. what people wouldn't know, usually there'd be wood there and wood in the bottom, but if you look at it, it's almost like a grand piano in length, but it's just laid on its, it's side, so it's yeah. like it really. And you always wonder why pianos are heavy. That is one huge piece of either brass or steel. I don't know what it's made out of, but yeah, large. It's sound massive. Board. Goes all the way to. You can see the strings. I know it may be hard with this camera, but the strings yeah. go all the way to the floor from the top to the bottom. Yeah, and people who've looked at this piano have told us that it, a lot of the strings look like they could be original or just mm -hmm. extremely old. So. At this point, we we're like, okay, we're we're just gonna ride this out as long as we can, and it's uh, it's been hanging in there. It's still, it still still gets used. Okay, so okay, we moved over to a very cool little tower of power of some amps. Can you give yeah. us some stories on these? Or oh yeah, from? this is. I mean, the the guitar amp section is definitely one of my favorite parts of the studio. Um, there's some amps in the red room as well, and kind of sprinkled throughout, but mm -hmm. a lot of them are kind of situated here. This is an old Tweed Super and uh, Gemini, Ampeg Gemini 1. This was actually my last uh, Everest stack. Um, just this Gemini is probably my favorite amp of all time. Um, I plugged into it uh, in a music store in Toronto and they wanted 450 bucks for it. And I played it probably for about an hour and gave them my money. Well, you know, people uh, also familiar with Queens of the Stone Age, when I went to Dave Catchings, and they have a lot of Ampeg amps, and you would be shocked on to go to, you know, your local thrifts or local music stores. There is a lot of different styles of, of those small Ampeg amps, which are rocking amps. Yeah, yeah. The the Gemini 1 is the 12-inch version, and mm -hmm. so far of the ones I've played, it's my favorite, and uh, it's got just a, a beautiful sounding tremolo on a unique sounding reverb and um, the amp itself breaks up perfect to me. Super is a cool amp because it's the the 210 inch okay. 
version so it has kind of an offset two tens mm -hmm. vibe and um, kind of like you know top and bottom or the yeah opposite, or yeah. some people consider it like a half basement mm -hmm. kind of thing. really cool sounding amp and uh yeah like I, i'm i mentioned earlier i'm a, such a fan of the tweeds and amps that actually use the tubes and use the rectifier tube even as part of their their breaking up and uh you know, distortion and everything. I love that natural sounding distortion, what it does for your ears. And obviously I have a twin 12. I'm assuming that's a twin 12 right there. Oh yeah, I've got, uh, yep, yeah, that is the twin 12. And uh, you know, to, we to have people a... that wouldn't know it, there's an amp inside the back of that cabinet, which yep. is so yeah. cool because you carry it around. It's, and it's like... amp and it's, and it's pedal or tucked yeah. inside there. We also have a 1483, which is the base version of that amp. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love the Silvertone stuff. Um, they're just such, I think, a part of that original rock and roll mm -hmm. garage sound, and it's really easy to plug into those kind of amps and get that sound. And, and you know, for people that are really fancy about studio, like what you're supposed to have in your studio, to tell you how cool these guys are, you know, they have their wood, and then you have your wall, and then you have a moose carpet or rug on the wall like you talk about no, a cool very important you know you talk about a cool thing to like stop the noise around the drums i mean you can be creative and still look cool that's awesome <laughs> you know the thing is we don't have any windows here and uh the kind of the the idea behind our place was uh at least for me was that for it to be very welcoming and homey when you come in here wanted it to be a warm vibe and because we don't have any windows which is actually kind of in some ways a nice thing because when you come in here you focus you can just kind of get creative mm -hmm. and, and work on music and so i like putting nice things that have like a, a warm uh, connotation or vibe to them so you'll see a lot of outdoorsy sort of cabin vibe things was kind of our leaning of, of yep. the way we go here there's also some some little you know a lot of beatles stuff and maybe a few star wars things here and there too and so it's kind of meant to have that kind of like you know relaxed homey vibe it's a big part of what what i think we're kind of about so and even some things that like may look like art pieces like the birds up there in the corner with that i love that gramophone has got a microphone in it so really yeah there's an old dynamic in being there. a small room it's kind of fun to have things like that that if people want to get creative they can i love that that is so cool speaking of a cool little <laughs> wall of sound what do we have here on these little guys and big guys yeah, um, I mean, a mix of stuff. This this Savage here is one I've had since the 90s. This mm -hmm. was built by Savage Audio. Uh, I believe they're in Minnesota. It's kind of a Marshall Bluesbreaker kind of vibe. And uh, it's a big, heavy amp. I used it live for a while. Um, Everest played a show at the Troubadour uh, with the band Brad, and Stone Gosser borrowed this from me at the show. Um, which was kind of a funny story, um, just an old friend using something that he had actually turned me on to. That's um, cool. And here we have two tungsten amps. Um, this is my friend Adam in Florida who builds these custom sort of early Fender, uh, a lot of them are tweed era amps. Mm -hmm. um, boutique stuff he does a really fantastic job uh, this is the Cortez this was my main Everest touring amp for most of most of the Everest career this was a big part of my sound and uh, it's it's basically a tweed deluxe that Adam and I modded together uh, with some some knowledge of the Neil Young uh, so you worked together with him on it it wasn't just like a yeah we kind of bounced things back That's and cool. forth about speaker and uh, what yeah, are the had discussions. Then? Well, the the thing for Neil's Neil's main tweed is a uh, C12N, Jensen Sweet C12N, um, and I think it was a 50 watt one. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a, the speaker. I don't I don't believe his speaker is distorting that much. Um, I think his speaker actually handles the output of his amp pretty well, but what you're really hearing is the tube sag and, and the tube distortion as, as you get the inner harmonic thing going between the channels. He almost makes the, 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 the amp turn into like a distortion pedal, but it's not affecting, the, it's not putting out like Eddie Van Halen is the opposite. He's pushing the speakers. Yeah. 
Uh, and Neil Young is getting the tone out of the amp. Out of the amp and out. I mean, he literally uses a machine to, con to, to control the different levels of distortion just on his amp. He doesn't use distortion pedals. So wow. that's, this amp is great for that. You can push it into d driving pretty early. And then even the other channel that you're m either jumping into or maybe not plugged into at all, the tone, the the Can you controls. still get those amps now? Like if you wanted to order them? Yeah, yeah. He's in business. Oh, that's and, awesome. uh, Yeah, he makes... This is another one uh, he makes called the Cream of Wheat. and uh, <laughs> Great name. Yeah, and it's got uh, tremolo in it. Great sounding amp. So these are... I love having these little tweed style amps because you can get so many different types of tone. I know I'm asking you to pick your kids, but between those two, which one do you pick? I mean, this is... This is I'm, I know this amp intimately well because okay. I used it so much live for years. So what um, is the model of that one? This is the Cortez. Cortez. Yeah, okay. as in Cortez the Killer. Mm-hmm. Killer Cortez. Shout out to Killer Cortez, our, yeah. our chief house engineer, my partner here at the studio. So yeah, um, really fun tweed amps, and they sound great for recording. And then below that is an old Magnatone 280, which has the th that has the vintage uh, stereo vibrato. So those are the real secret sauce. If you can get a Magnatone, oh my God, those things it's, are crazy good. It's really a cool amp, and it, it does like almost Stonesy sort of stuff, mm -hmm. but also is really good at getting that Neil Young kind of warble sound yeah. too, which is that's one of the amps he uses as well. Another. Another direct influence. All right, cool. Yeah. This is our um, 65 Slingerland um, champagne gold sparkle kit. Um, Beautiful. This is the house kit that's here. It gets used uh, on a lot of sessions just because it's, sometimes it's, it's handy not to have to bring in a drum kit. Um, we understand that most musicians kind of have their own thing and want their own sound. Um, this gets pulled out of the way a lot too. Yeah, I've had this kit for over 20 years. We've owned the studio for going on 20 years now, and uh, it's been here the whole time, so it's been on a lot of records through the years. Congratulations on that. Yeah, thanks. So tell me about the actual drum. So I know this is a, an, an, an older drum set. What, what is the snare? That looks kind of new, correct? Yeah, snare is newer. Uh, this is actually, uh, um, I believe, Yamaha Steve Ferroni model, which... Uh, is I think more or less based on the Black Beauty mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was recommended a long time ago uh, by a friend uh, who was sort of a Black Beauty aficionado of like how to get a good sounding snare drum for yep. a decent price so uh, we've had this one for a long time and yeah I think it's sort of the main snare here we have a we have a few other Ludwigs, Acrylite, a um, few other things around, but uh, this one does get used a lot when people don't bring in their own, that is. And also, um, what is that kick? Is that a 20, 22? I think it is 22, if memory serves. And I know people would think like yeah. a smaller drum would be maybe smaller sound, but in these drum sets, it's like a bigger sound sometimes, you know? It's, you know, there's so much has to do with how you know how to, how to, tune and you know baffle or not baffle or mm -hmm. the, the heads are so sensitive on these this is being sort of a student model drum kit um, it's not super thick um, it's not super thick plied uh, wood or anything like that so um, it's pretty lively as it is so yep. I think a lot of times people are kind of um, deadening it up a bit to get sounds that they want but it's you know it's it's an instrument that's very usable. Now, I love the way you did your ceilings. You know, everything is kind of angled, nothing straight. And for people that don't know about it, studios that are kind of with crooked walls are usually the best. So I see that this place was definitely made super cool. Was this a studio before Elliot even came in here? Yeah, so from what we know about it, it was built uh, as a jazz studio uh, in the 80s. It was, it was designed out very specifically, as you can tell from the live room, this half it has this sort of dampening over this part of the room, mm -hmm. whereas the other half of the room is... Oh, that's is, dampened. That's not a hard surface. No, it's soft. It's uh, cloth. That is cool. So um, it has soundproofing behind it as mm -hmm. well. So, And then on the other side of the room, it's almost entirely wood. Yeah, it's all rustic. So and... it's way more reflective and... But it was being that it was built as a, as a recording studio in the 80s, 
there's not a lot of parallel or perpendicular surfaces. They were kind of wary about trying to make sure there weren't standing sine wave problems yeah. and stuff like All that. All right, so we are going into where kind of the main hub of the studio, the control room, and look at that console. Please, so let's start with that point. Let's just talk about that bad sure. boy. Yeah, <laughs> kind of hard to miss. Yeah, it's, right. It takes up a little bit of the room. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is our Trident A range console um, that Elliot purchased in what we've been told as uh, a three piece deal with a Fairchild 670 mm -hmm. and a U48. So he brought all those in here to the studio where, where the, they reside still. Um, the console, we believe, is one of the early A ranges. And from what I understand, understand, there was only between like 13 to 17 maybe at the most it's made and uh, this seems to be an early one uh, we've been told maybe number three or so uh, it has the eight bus which the later ones had more many more buses um, so up to 24 I believe so this kind of and the also the the color of the console itself uh, seems to suggest that this was a pretty old one um, we believe it was originally commissioned and purchased uh, by Le Studio uh, in Marin Heights outside Montreal, where it was uh, used throughout the 70s on a bunch of records by uh, Rush, Cat Stevens, um, myriad of artists that, that came through uh, that pretty legendary studio during that time. And then uh, it went through Nashville, it sounds like, in the 80s, and eventually Elliot brought it here in the 90s, uh, where it's been since. Now, do you guys use those big old mains over there? We do at times. I love the mains. Uh, we kind of we kind of refer to the mains as the A and R speakers. Right. Kind of it's kind of the thing to like blow everybody's hair back uh, when they come into the room. But it's nice to have these big old, you know, fifteen inch non concentric speakers blowing out at at people in this control room. And the, the control room was designed uh, as a controlled sound room, so it does mm -hmm. sound good in here. And uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to listen to stuff on those. It gives you that live feeling a little bit. All right, so behind the console are some really cool hidden gems. What do we have here in this large refrigerator type machine? <laughs> Back here is uh, is Elliot's Sony MCI JH24. It's our two inch analog 24 track machine. It's, it's the workhorse here for any analog sessions that go down. It's been here the entire time that we've been here. Uh, next to that is the uh, kind of the famous mix down machine. It's the ATR 102 half inch. Uh, just a fantastic sounding um, tape mix down machine. Uh, Plug-in is used by a lot of people to make their mixes sound a little a little better, <laughs> a little warmer, a little tighter, and it, it does a thing that's really cool. It's fun to have the real thing for the people who want that. And, and what um, was the history? That was Jane's Addiction, right? Yes, yes. That machine was previously owned by Jane's Addiction, and uh, I bought that from them uh, out of a storage locker they had uh, down in Santa Monica. And I, from what I understand, it was used at their studio in Venice as the main mix-down machine for a lot of their records uh, back in the day. So I'd like to think that some of those classic uh, Jane's Addiction things were uh, those albums potentially went through that machine. Nice. Um, and then next to that, uh, old uh, Otari uh, quarter-inch machine that we use as a slapback on occasion. Uh, it's like the John Lennon vocal thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, Aaron Espinoza from the band Early Mart, his handwriting's on the the uh, the reel there, the flange. So yeah. uh, that's from us probably doing exactly that, doing the, the Lennon slapback thing on some vocals right. here. Cool, cool, cool. And there's some, some little pieces of Elliot here around the studio that are time to time nice reminders of, mm -hmm. of his spirit. And one of those things here, it says, but I don't stand idly by. This was uh, a bit of uh, label maker tape that, that Elliot stuck on there, which we were told was a, a reference to a Fugazi lyric. I think he maybe got slightly wrong, but he was close. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also there's some things here around the studio that still bear little stickers and personality from from when he was in here 
doing a lot of solo recording uh, by himself, so uh, he would use this this little amp farm thing to send signal out to the control room. I mean, from the control room to the tracking room, so he could sit in here and be able to run sessions while still recording himself playing guitar and stuff like that. So there's a lot of like little things like that in the notes on the Fairchild that are uh, hand handwritten elements of, of Elliot that we've tried to leave intact. We're going to run the garden of a few things here he's got in there. Some yeah. of the special sauce. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we kind of divided things by what they do. So mm -hmm. after the the pre's and EQ's and stuff, so, there's some EQ's here as well. Um, and uh, some Siemens EQ's as well as quad eights and the aforementioned K and H. And then uh, compression, we've got Trident stereo compressor as well as uh, a set of Neve compressors and uh, distressors. Uh, which Alan Smart 2 or is that an SSL, the black one? Uh, yeah, Alan Smart. A C1, I believe. Yeah. All right, so now I see those big old meters. What do we got over here? Uh, oh, this is it. This is the, uh, this is the Fairchild 670. It has a few little markings here that were uh, the last settings that were on it uh, mm -hmm. when Elliot used it, and so we just we left those on there. Um, I don't know if they were favorites or just happened to be there when it was last used, but um, this is, uh, as you know, uh, rare as hen's teeth, and um, when we purchased the studio, this this was one of the key pieces that Elliot had. Uh, that put together with this, and um, it's it's definitely a centerpiece of the studio, and that's something that everyone who comes in here wants to try out. And I uh, want to try that out. Yeah, hear how it sounds. And uh, Charlie Bolas over at Vertigo Recording Services uh, looks after it for us and uh, comes out and makes sure that it's all biased right and set up correctly, and the tubes are running correctly and all that stuff. It's got a city of tubes behind it in the back, okay. so we've got fans out the back of the the uh, of the rack to, mm -hmm. to keep the airflow going. So, um, and then that's followed by a couple gates and the old uh, CBS volume axe and and then on this end of the rack we have all the the kind of legacy UA stuff um, dating back to an old uh, Teletronics LA-2A, and then um, we have a relationship with Universal Audio because they modeled their Trident A-Range plug-in off of this very console. Uh, they spent the time of uh, booking the studio for a week and coming out here and running the console through every pace that they could to, to find out exactly what the sound was, and they based their uh, plug-in off of that. So uh, we've had a long relationship with the Putnam family and uh, great respect for them. As you know, audio legends in uh, the world, let alone in Los Angeles. So um, really happy to have a great relationship with them. Um, we also use their Apollos for our digital world. But uh, they gave us a newer LA-2A, so we could have two. And the uh, same with 1176s, we've got an old uh, Yuri original one that Elliot had purchased here, and then a newer uh, version of uh, the LN from uh, UA. And then you got a 175, right? Under that, the 175, yeah, not uh, not seen too frequently, but that was no. the OG that kind of predated some of this other stuff. Those are tube, correct? Uh, yes, yes, tube, tube machine. I mean, you think about it, the LA 2A is a tube, but you don't necessarily think of 1176s as being tubes, you know. So it's kind of cool when you get the OG, and it was it was definitely that sound, you know. Yes, yeah, and it's it's um, it's definitely got that that girth to it. Uh, mm -hmm. It adds a a tube. Um, thickness to it it's just it's a that's an incredible and sound. then i will say the sleepers which a lot of people don't know about the la three a's and i know i'm just talking about like if i talk to any producer from any time in any era they always tell me like you know 1176s people think those were for guitars they tell me that the la three a's they're that some of those are their favorite like even bob clear mountain and absolutely people that are epic will tell you how great la three a's are you know Yes, I mean that's it's a common theme here when people see them. They're like, "Oh, good," because they know that it, yeah. it works great on guitars. Um, 
Yeah, well, it's, I know uh, Greg Cortez, our, my partner and chief house engineer here, is a huge fan on, of using him on guitars. And, um, and so people don't know, he's yeah. standing right behind us right yeah. now. <laughs> and the reason we don't have everyone in is the Manny production. I only had two lavaliers when I came in, so yeah. we're keeping the essentials going. But make sure you check out the, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the release of the mic locker of this studio of New Monkeys. So you have to check it out. You'll get a boatload of Mr. Kila Cortez. Cortez the Kila. And um, make sure that you follow them on Instagram. Make sure that if you are an indie band and you're thinking about recording, how sweet would it be to come down there and actually be able to use the same studio Elliot Smith had made some great recordings with. And they definitely don't have a, a B list of artists that are still in here. It's A list. So a lot of people come in here that are the real deals and so this is a really working man studio and i'll add also i spent a lot of time loving sound city which is in van nuys it's really incredible that here's another studio mm -hmm. that kind of embellishes what that studio was about but yet gratefully is still here making records in both of you guys you know uh, to add to that, uh, I worked at Sound City as a runner and was learning to be an assistant engineer at Sound City uh, back what years? in about 99. Um, and uh, so I started learning from working at Sound City and um, huge sessions would come through there and uh, it was an important part of me learning about studio life and how to take care of a studio and, uh, and all that stuff that came along with it and also the fascination with analog recording and um, how to get a coffee right and order a sandwich right <laughs> how to clean a coffee pot correctly oh my god yeah <laughs> i used to see the techs clean the neve consoles where they'd be put them all out on a table and you'd just be squeaking every knob every oh, channel no. every it, that neve console was a beast to clean so i imagine yeah, like when people look at your console that yeah. is something that is a work of art right there yeah, and if people don't so. know what an a range is it's what everybody talks about from like David Bowie, or there was a classic sense of these consoles. If you got later Tridents, I'll be honest with you, I always felt like they're a little bassy and boomy. Hmm. But when you talk about the A ranges, it's pretty much talking about like the Bentleys or the, you know, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, whatever you want to say, the highest sports car in the world that are made with the best, you know, precision. Uh, the Trident A range was made for serious cats, and it's a serious console, and there's only a few of them on Earth. So. Yeah. You guys are lucky to have an, a console intact that hasn't been parted out. I think through time, most of the existing ones have been parted out. I think yeah. very few of the actual whole frames of the consoles are even can be found anymore. It's so big. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a dinosaur in that way, but it's also known for being great for all those records, be it Bowie or Elton John yep. or ACDC, for being great on guitar and drums. Yep. It's kind of like a signature part of like what we know of a lot of that stuff, how yep. it sounds, so the, the British part of the sound. And from what we know, it was kind of put together by some of the top engineers at the time, kind of put their heads together and were like, well... What are we missing from what we're getting from the consoles that are coming over from the states? And what do we want? What do we need for EQ? And so there's a, there's a kind of a, a melding of minds on this mm -hmm. console too, from what we understand. That Malcolm Toft was talking to Ken Scott and uh, Jeff Emmerich and people like that, all of whom have actually come into this room because they were they were interested in seeing and talking about probably the console brought them here more than anything. Anything, and also a little note on on the studio. There is a Jeff. Emmerich um, episode that they'll be hopefully putting together soon that you can see the full interview of him talking about Mike's recording gear, the Beatles. He actually came down to this studio and physically was here Sat right talking here. with him yeah. before his passing, God rest his soul. Yeah. Um, he was definitely dedicated to the arts and I think that's what's important about these kind of studio tours is they are dedicated to the art and it's now the art of making music and also now staying alive. That's what we're about. It's the bottom line of anything we're doing is the music. This yeah. is all about the art. We're not doing this for the money. And obviously, it, it's owning a studio in this day and age is more of a challenge than a, it's not a money-making thing right. in most cases. So for us, this has been a labor of love and, and a desire to see uh, people continue making records in Elliot's place. And uh, we'll be going on our 20th year in August. Um, we're going to have a big celebration uh, announcement coming on that real soon. And... Uh, 
a celebration and, a, and an honoring of Elliot because uh, Elliot put all this together and started this ball rolling and uh, it's yeah it's a it's been a, a red balloon that we've been chasing for almost 20 years now and it's it's such a labor of love it's a real pride and joy i think you us. caught the balloon it's right here <laughs> fist bumps amazing yeah, tour thanks for thanks having so us much, i Manny. hope you enjoyed it and make sure that you follow the links to their studio on instagram find out where they are and like i said if you're a musician an artist or someone that dreamt about recording somewhere that's a safe haven for artists definitely look them up definitely book them out and that's it. Yeah. Adios. Thanks, man. Brother! Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, okay. That was awesome, man.